Well, we hear before we go any further, Mel, I want to just bring something up that's been coming up in the comment section. Uh, you probably noticed people and those of you who have, are, do read the comment section, a number of you have asked or queried, why is it now we're coming up with this material on the Dome of the Rock, which confronts what we've done earlier. And that's true. It does confront. And they're wondering as, you know, what's going on here, Jay and Mel? You keep on coming up with different areas that contradict each other. You're not keep, you're not, you're not saying the same thing you said two months ago. And, and this is one of the, um, you might say one of the exciting things about the kind of work we do, isn't it, Mel? Why is it that we keep coming up with different things? Go ahead and explain to the our audience what's going on here and why is it that we we will come up and we will say what we didn't say two months earlier or even a year earlier. I think it's essential that we turn over every single rock so that we really know if we if if the explanations that we've come up with is the best one. Uh, we can't just suddenly um, say, OK, now we found the truth. Let's not look any further. And that's a temptation. Um, I think we have to leave our egos at the door. I think this is an act of humility when we say, well, we don't know the full picture yet. We're going to have a look at different papers. Um, we're going to look and see that there's some strengths and some weaknesses. Like I, I would openly admit there are weaknesses with AJ Juice's paper, but no paper is perfect. But it's good to examine the evidence, keep an open mind, and then it may advance where we were from a few months ago. I think everything that we've done so far has always pushed things forward. If we look at the Dome of the Rock um, in particular, um, the work that Murad did, uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago, when he first pr proposed the idea that it's talking about Jesus, and people thought, oh, wow, wow that's that's quite a jump. And then Thomas Alexander um, focused on the anti-Trinitarian aspect, and th again, that brought something forward, and he specifically focused on the word Muhammad and how it related to um, blessed you know, is whatever. Um, and then Red Judaism, then he just blew that all out of the water again by proposing that actually it was towards a Jewish audience. It's not that um, we need to take the opinion that one person is completely right, another person is completely wrong. I think there's, there's truth in all of that, but we won't know where it all fits together until we see it all. And then in retrospect, we'll be able to say, ah, oh, it's a bit of this, a bit of this and then we produce a final sort of sentences. But I, th I think I think we're on the right track. Um, and I think th my background is I used to do programming. And in programming, we have this thing called if then. If something, then something. So in terms of the rock inscriptions, I would say, well, if they are from the seventh century, then what follows is what people like Thomas Alexander has said and read Judaism, and that's powerful, and that destroys the standard Islamic narrative by itself. However, if A.J. Juice is right that this is actually a later inscription, then what follows from that is also very explosive. Um, so I think, I think we can give ourselves the time to examine all these things and not not, cons not see this as categorical just yet. It's, it's hypothetical. If all of this evidence turns out to be on the ball, on the money, then we can start making categorical uh, conclusions. I think this is, I think you described this as sort of a, a green paper, Jay. Now, let me jump in there and explain what we're yeah. talking about. And just so people, just so our audience is aware, almost everything that you have uh, been witnessing in the last two to three, um, almost even four years on Fander Films, now on Origins. Uh, in fact, the whole Origins site is dedicated just to this question on the origins of Islam, has been from the context of a what-if scenario. And this came out, this was a first done in my experience with Dr. Patricia Corona and Michael Cook, Dr. Michael Cook, who wrote Hagarism back in the 1970s. And in the very first page, they said, this is a what if scenario. And people didn't read that. And people thought that the Hagarism was a done deal, was a, a definitive uh, exposition on how Islam began. No, they, that's why they said on the very first page, this is a what if scenario. From what we have here in the 1970s, everything that we have in our hand, this is how we think it happened. 
Now, that has been vilified and they have had to go and they've had to change and ameliorate. And that should be expected because no, remember what we're doing. And I think this has, we, we have to remind our audience what we're asking, the questions that we're asking, the material that we're discovering, nobody really has looked at before, primarily because nobody has dared to look at this material. No one has ever questioned the standard Islamic narrative before. It's not healthy to do that, especially if you're in academia and uh, you have to get into these countries to continue your research, to be able to have this type of relationship within, within Muslim countries. Muslim countries do not like their origins questioned, their Quran questioned, their prophet questioned, their history questioned. And that's why there has been rare, rarely anybody from academia has asked these kind of questions. And when Patricia Corona and Michael Cook did so in the 1970s, it, it blew everything open. Remember when uh, Dr. Uh, John Wansborough dared to write Quranic studies and sectarian milieu in the uh, mid to late 1970s, those two books caused him to have death threats. He had to stop all his research as an academic and move over into French material. He completely stopped what he was doing because it was too dangerous. So be aware of that, that what we're, what, what we're unpacking. Now, Patricia Corona and Michael Cook were just two people, and all they had were those two people and a few students to help them out. We have many more people. There's seven of us now. I'm going to be introducing Lloyd De Jong in just about a week. Uh, after we do this series, he'll be the next one to continue. There'll be we'll be up to eight of us, and many, many more who are helping us out who don't want to put their face in front of a camera. We have many more to work with. We can go much quicker. We have the internet, which Patricia Crone and, and Michael Cook did not have, nor did John Wansborough. We have an awful lot more PDFs. We have so many more areas that we can that we can really delve into. We can look at the coins. We can look at the inscriptions. We're now looking at the, at inscriptions on the dome of the rock we can go hit, hit so many different areas but because of that it's hard to put it all together yet because we're uncovering rocks that no one's ever uncovered before and if they had uncovered them before they always assumed the islamic narrative was would help explain it and the islamic narrative hasn't explained it that was the problem with the coins they were looking at christian symbols and yet these were all supposed to be muslim people and muslim caliphs and that's the difficulty of the kind of work we do. So these are green papers. Be aware of that. What we're putting out there uh, is not the solidified. People are saying, when are you going to write this up? We dare not write this up. We dare not publish what we know until we know that, the, that we know what we have found and we understand it and we can see the, the um, evolution of the origins of Islam. Until we get to that point, don't expect us to write books. However, Everything we do discover, we're going to put out for you guys and gals, because you need to hear it. You need to see what's happening. And then for heaven's sakes, tell us where we're wrong. Tell us where we're right. Run or come along with us. This is a great adventure. I don't think we've anybody's done what we're doing uh, and at this fast with this many ideas and this many people who, interestingly, are all coming to the same conclusions. Now, let me put a little caveat on that. We're not always coming to the same conclusions now. You notice with what, Mel, what you just put up on the Dome of the Rock using A.J. Deuce's material, it does not is not agreed to by Thomas Alexander. He said so. And thank God that Thomas Alexander is on our team. And thank God that he, that he refuses to accept your thesis. Yet, yet, that doesn't mean he will even in the future. That doesn't bother Mel. Does it bother you? I don't no. think it does. Not so bad, no. No, and actually, I think that's the healthy thing. To have, um, I, I would rather seven people with seven perspectives than seven people all robotically copying each other's opinions. I think that would would be unhelpful. Um, and the thing is, if you, it's kind of like if if you're searching for something in a field, if you got seven people looking in different directions, they're more likely to find something than if everyone was looking at the same point on in, on the field. You know. And let, let me just say, it's not, it's only the seven of us, it'll be eight who are putting our face and actually into and actually uh, putting videos together. There are many more that are in the background who do not want to be seen and do not want to be heard and do not feel comfortable. S some of the reasons for security reasons, others because they don't feel comfortable in front of a camera and many of them because they just do not want to have to 
hassle, have the hassles that we have to face all the time with because we do put our faces in front of the camera. I just wanted to, I think it's good for people to realize we are moving slowly but surely towards the white papers. These are the green papers we're putting out. The ones that we're putting out for your reaction because we need you to be a part of this. And it's important that you do respond. Some of you, it's been terrific. Some of the areas that you sent us to, you've sent us articles or you sent us other pieces of pottery or pieces of, of inscription. And it helps us so that we can then put it into the entire uh, well, the entire edifice that we are building in the edifice, or you might see the puzzle that we're trying to finish. That puzzle will be finished at some point. And when we get to that, then we will publish, then we will be able to have definitive works. And because of the fact that we have demanded that everything we say gets sourced, that everything we say can be seen from a 7th, 8th, and ninth century environment and not after, because we've demanded that from the get-go, uh, it'll make it much stronger for those of you who are following these discussions to then use it in your own ministry, in your own work, with your own people, and in your own time. Anything else you want to say, Mel, before we end this segment as an explanation? I'd say just to everyone, um, keep critiquing the standard Islamic narrative, but don't be afraid to critique our work as well. And I think that it's all done in a good spirit. Um, there's no animosity between any of the team if we criticize each other. We realize that we're all in it to discover what the truth is. We may differ on certain points, but that's no, no problem. The truth will survive all of the critiques. The, the falsehoods will be sifted out in due course. That's my view. Okay, well, we're the SHN. They have the SIN, the standard Islamic narrative. We are the standard historical narrative. Uh, so if you want to put us, critique both. We both need criticism, at the, uh, but we do need to come to conclusions, and we are going to get there. Give us time. We'll be there. All right, terrific. Thanks so much, Mel, for coming on board and explaining that. This is Mel and Jay, a few thousand miles apart, though it looks like right, right next door. Over and out. <music>